Thank you. So I'm here to talk to you about like how you can modernize your application. And if we look at the uh, journey from Apple, we see that over the years they improved, evolved the typography and the colors of the operating system. And we start with this iOS 6, like super schematic interface, and then new fonts were added, and uh, we got large text, high contrast, bold text, even dark mode now with, with iOS 13. And we got size classes, so apps can adapt to any screen size. And this is really great. You get it for free if you're using a very specific native styling and you don't support older iOS versions. Who does this? We are in a safe space here. We are friends. We can admit it. Like the stock appearance, it's not super exciting unless you're Daniel presenting combined <laughs> with counters. Um, most apps implement custom styling. They want to represent their brands and they want to be more exciting. And maintaining those stylings over time can be a little bit challenging. You get like tens and hundreds of releases and your code base accumulates some color. What counts as custom styling? It's anything a designer will ask you to do. It is basically changing the color or size of something and suddenly, oh, my app is custom now. So it doesn't come for free for me. And I think it's very common. At least in my experience, I never worked on an app that gets those for free. It's a lie. Like a lot of apps rely on the native typography, but a lot of apps also use custom fonts and colors, et cetera, et cetera. So what? New versions of iOS are coming every day. iOS 13, 13.1. 13 it's like we need to adapt. Imagine like Apple puts this bar super high and people have expectations. They go buy the next iPhone. It's iPhone Max, Pro, X, whatever. And your app just will look out of place. You want to be a good citizen. You don't want to be that app, right? And we know over time we get new APIs and they prepare us and it's like, now you need to support this. Oh, I'm super unprepared. No, we got new APIs with each iOS release and over time things become requirements like the multitasking support. The deadline is next year, you all know, right? You're ready, okay. So today we are gonna take a realistic look at how an app that existed for a couple of years can adopt those uh, new modern customizations without sacrificing custom styling. Let's start with color. Besides supporting high contrast and dark mode, which are the two new things with iOS 13, um, modernizing your colors will help you to do some more subtle changes, like for example, tweaking your colors to have better contrast, or doing more big changes, like the next big redesign of your app. So these techniques, I hope, will be useful for you, whatever your current situation is. The amount of effort you need to put into this really depends on your current situation, like the starting point. And we'll look into these four common starting points um, and see how we can get to a better state. So hard-coded colors, it's really the simplest way you can get a color. It's either in the interface builder, you just select from picker, or in code you use some initializer, you can use the color literals and pick a color. Whenever you need it, you just select one. And it's hard-coded because every time you select a new color and it's not reusing another one, you create a new instance that has no connection to the other ones. But there good because they're quick and visual and in a lot of cases this is exactly what you need. You don't need to feel bad about the fact that there is hard-coded words there. Um, when it comes to tweaking colors, um, it can be a little bit tricky because if you want to change one color with different version of that color 
and it's all over the place in your code base, what can you do? Like you can use find and replace, but imagine you're using red color for some text, for some badge, for some background, and you change red to, I don't know, yellow, and then you get unexpected uh, results in some cases. So you need to go through your app and probably go one by one case or just uh, fix the remaining cases. And if you have a small app, that's perfectly fine. So no need to make changes if you have a small app and it's perfectly fine to go through all the screens. If you want to add variations based on traits um, to support dark mode and high contrast, because those two user accessibility preferences, they come in the shape of trait collection attributes, um, then you need to make some changes to your code. So if you're using Interface Builder and you support, you have like the depl deployment target iOS 11 plus, then you can use the named colors, which is the new thing in the asset catalog where you can put your colors as the images. And there you can um, configure them to have different configurations for different trade collections. And if you, uh, do things in code, and you have all of these hard-coded things here and there, you will need to do a lot of repetitive actions, and that can be a little bit boring. But another common starting point is color constants. When you use the same color over again, and you're like, I don't want to copy-paste this every time, you just extract it to a constant. Um, I've seen a lot of apps that do this. And with this approach, um, you get a nice overview of your product palette in one place, which means that you can also see the colors that you need to tweak. And again, with hard-coded colors, here we have the same risks that if you update one color, it might not be exactly as you expected in all the places because you don't know how the colors are used. So if you have green, dark, and you change it to yellow, it might be used in very different cases. But uh, for variations based on traits, since you have everything in one place, it's kind of easier to add it just in one place and um, benefit from it. And we'll see an example. The third common starting point is having semantic colors. And I don't know how common is that starting point, but now we get more and more um, introduced through semantic colors from different companies. And this is the way Apple wants us to actually implement these accessibility improvements. So here, as you can see, you have a palette again, but instead of exposing the palette directly and making it public, you can make it private and then you expose other methods that give the intent of the color, not the name of the color. So this allows you to update colors based on usage. Um, this is really nice. And because the API doesn't give you any guarantees what kind of color is this, the implementation behind the scenes can switch it. So this is what we'll see in example in a minute. Um, it also worth mentioning that a lot of big companies are moving to this pattern. Um, like Google had material design for some time now. A lot of design systems are moving to semantic colors. And Apple, with the latest release, also is introducing um, changes. So first, they are deprecating some of their current methods that imply the color. Like the activity indicator used to be um, white or gray. Now those will be deprecated, and you get medium and stuff like this that uh, imply how it should be used. And you also get new UI element colors. I think right now it's about like 15 colors that they expose, but might change with the betas. Um, and you get colors that are called like label, separator, link, fill color, and so on and so forth. And the last one I want to look at, because I also seen it in many apps, is color teaming. It's the approach where you already have interface that adapts to different teams. Um, and you have one protocol where you describe what kind of um, colors you have, and then you have different implementations. So if you have something like this, um, you already might have infrastructure that loads the team on the um, app launch, for example. You check some flag, and then you decide which team to use. If you have a solution like this, you can create a new team or use one of your existing teams to say, hey, if dark mode is enabled on iOS 13, I want to provide this team that I think is more suitable for dark interfaces. If you do this also only on app launch, this is what I call like static teaming. 
um, then you get static dark mode as well. Um, because if the user, while using your app, goes to settings and change their setting, it will not adapt automatically. But I would argue that that's better than having no dark mode support, um, because I don't think that everyone will go to settings and just check, is this app adapting now if I change it runtime? Um, and another color theming solution that you might have is more dynamic one, where if you have app that you allow the user to go and check uh, change their skin of the app, um, you expect as they click and apply the theme that it will automatically populate. So if you have theming solution like this, you already have some infrastructure to tell all of the views, hey, update. Um, it depends how you implement it, like if your um, implementation relies on some global notification that you change as they change the theme. Um, there is, I need to tell you that there is no like system-wide notification for um, dark mode or other trade collection changes, but it doesn't stop you to implement in one place like trade collection did change if you have certain um, place that is always on the screen, you can check there and propagate to all of your views. So in that case, your work with dark mode is pretty much done and you don't need to do a lot of things. But not a lot of apps use color teaming. So now let's look at three practical examples and see how we can support high contrast, dark mode, and how we can move to these semantic colors if we had no clue before that we would like to have our code structured that way. For high contrast, um, this is a solution that you can implement on any deployment target. Like if you still support iOS 10 or I even iOS 9, you can have something like this. And you conditionally check um, for iOS 13, and then you um, check the trace accessibility contrast property. This is what gives you if it's high contrast or normal contrast or unspecified. So. This is a new initializer from UI Color. It's from iOS 13. And what it gives us is a block that passes the trait collection, and then you can decide what to return based on the block. And it does a lot of magic for us. So it's environment aware, and no matter where you put this code, it will change the color of your view, all of the views set up. It's pretty nice. So here I put it in view that load, which is not the best place to put your styling code, um, but it will still work. So it illustrates a point that it's dynamic. Um, it is not necessary to switch to semantic colors if you're using such approach, but I would highly recommend to do so and to centralize it so that in the point where you access the color, you have like pretty clean API and it doesn't know about all of this magic that is happening behind the scenes. And then you have it in another place. You say, highlight background. If it's this version of iOS, I want to return this. If it's that trace, I want to return that. Um, just caveat here is that you need to choose names that are semantic names so that the users of this API don't uh, expect that this will be red, only red. Hmm? And if you are more modern and you're dropping iOS versions like there is no tomorrow, you can move your stuff to the asset catalog as well and have your colors more visual there and be able to uh, like click and select the colors that you want for a particular trade collection. Right, so now we added high contrast. If we want to add dark mode as well, we can implement, uh, we can extend that highlight color and we can switch both on the accessibility contrast but on the user interface style as well. With the user interface style, we get dark, we get light and unspecified and you can default to something uh, like the same color if it's prior iOS 13. So this, again, you can use with deployment target iOS 10, the new stuff will be used only on iOS 13, so it gives you nice compatibility between versions. And same as before, if you drop iOS 10, you can move to the assets catalog and have a nice preview of your colors. The third example is about moving to semantic colors. And this one is a little bit more um, lengthy as an example, and it takes a little bit more time, to be honest. 
I did something similar this summer, and I couldn't help thinking about this Netflix show that I watched. It's called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo, and it's like basically refactoring people's houses. <laughs> So she goes to houses and they're like super messy. They don't have space to walk in the house. And she's like, I will pray for your house and now we'll take these four steps and everything will be great. So this is what we're going to do. <laughs> so first thing that Marie teaches us is that you should organize by type, not location. So in the context of our semantic colors, this means you will take all of the colors and organize them and not get tempted to organize also your type or your metrics or stuff, just colors. So in order to get all of your colors, you need to prepare some kind of query to know where your colors at. So it can be search query with regular expression or something like this, or you just know your whole app by heart and that's still fine. Um, and don't forget to also include like system colors like dot white, dot black. Those can be a little bit tricky, um, but yeah, those are also colors that you use in your app. And then you gather everything together. You just put everything in one place and it becomes like a huge pile of things. But don't worry, that's intermediate state. So this is how a small app extracting its colors can look like. We just gather all the colors. So you go and see, oh, I'm using green here. And it's, what is this? It's email field and it's sent. Okay, I'll extract it to email sent text and I put exactly the same color. On this step, it's super important to not make any decisions about the colors. Don't get tempted to remove colors, to modify colors. I'm telling you, I've done this and then I reverted all my changes. I was like, I will be a good citizen and I will just move step by step. Because you end up in this situation where you have modifications, renamings and actual changes and you give it to your colleagues and it's like, can you review please? No, no one's going to review this. So keep your modifications separate from your like renamings. So here we just extract, move things around. And next step, when we're ready with this, is to consolidate a little bit. So we see, OK, I have all of these green text colors. What is it? OK, it's the action. I have an action in my um, email form, in the continue form. I have all of these yellows that represent the same thing. So I'm just going to use some more generic names. And I'm going to keep the same color. So still no changes, actual changes made. But we get to a nicer uh, place. And you can put them in two separate locations so that the old colors, it shows like, OK, I need to get rid of this. And the new colors is what you keep. And at the end, it looks nice and tidy, and you have new descriptive names. You iterate, you iterate, and then you end up with things that you don't know what to do with them. So they will be tricky ones. And this process takes some time. You need to accept it. Put some music, like relax, do some meditation. I don't know, but just like don't be too hard on yourself and for the tricky ones go speak to someone like ask your designer to come to sit next to you and decide together what to do if you have like 10 shades of gray and you're like why do we have all of these things like can we just use this two three um, and there you will make actual changes so make sure to commit them separately to give people time to react to say yeah this is this is not such a big change we can live with that in the results, you will have around 10 to 15 different semantic meanings. And if you wonder what those semantic meanings are and how should I name my semantic colors, you can look at some examples. I will share the slides. I know you can't click now. Um, but um, a lot of design systems for big companies are already uh, open source. Like IBM has a really good design system out there. It's called Carbon. So you can go on their website and check. They have around 45 colors that they use um, around web and their different apps. So you end up with globally accessi accessible colors. They're only in one place. You can decide to keep them in code. You can put them in the assets catalog. It's up to you. And when you do that, 
you're ready, right? And nothing changes. No, code bases evolve. You need to keep this maintainable. And here are some tips I really strongly recommend to add linter rules to make sure that semantic colors are used everywhere and people don't just like, oh, now I need to create this RGB here and I'm just gonna use initializer because this is gonna bring more mess to the like clean house that we have. Um, I recommend adding clinters even if you are not ready. So I had this asterisk on the gather everything together. It might not be realistic for you. You might have huge app and you're like, I need to spend months on this. Hey, product manager, can I spend months on this? No, okay. So you cover as much as you can and you start with the things that are easy, so like action color, text colors, other stuff that are used everywhere. And do this, and you can also delegate work to your colleagues, but the place where you consider this is cleaned up and this is done, there you add linter, and it's okay to have exceptions, but at least you know what is in a good shape and what's not. And another thing to keep in mind is that it's way more useful if you do this in collaboration with your designers or other peer developers, because if the next day after you're done with this, you receive a color that is slightly different from the ones that you extracted, you will be like, uh, but semantic colors, can we just, please? No, um, you talk to your designers, make everyone commit, and yeah, you will be in a better place. Um, moving to some caveats, because nothing comes without caveats. If that's not enough for now, there are more. Um, no Xcode support for renaming assets. That should be familiar to some of you that are using the assets catalog. Um, if you're using color constants in code from the assets catalog using the UI color named. There, I suggest you use some kind of code generation so that whenever you rename something in the assets catalog, you know that it's gonna be the same string in your code. Um, but for interface builder, I don't have a solution. If you currently select a color in the interface builder that's semantic color, and then you go rename that color, Interface Builder just says missing color. And it doesn't even crash, so you need to deal with it somehow. Cool, more caveats. Um, named colors can't reference other named colors. Um, yeah, so you might have mo multiple semantic meanings that have the same color value at the end of the day, and then you decide, oh, I want a little bit better contrast for this color, so I'm gonna change it here and you need to go change it there and there and there. So for that, I recommend using some kind of script if you think that this is likely to happen for you. If you think how often colors change anyway, you might just skip this. But if you think that your color is gonna change, I recommend paying attention to this. So that's about colors. Now we'll look into typography. And we'll look into ways to modernize your text to adapt to um, different size and eligibility user preferences. So text, text is essential part of any application. And for visually impaired users, this might be the difference between them using your app and like being just not able or preferring another app that supports um, both text and larger text better. And if you think like, yeah, how many are those people? like? I don't really know. Well, PSPDF Kit has this excellent blog post about observing that for their PDF viewer, it's about 27% of the people that have different setting from the default one. So they choose to go to settings and change their setting. And I think we should respect that. And if not other thing, think about yourself. We are all aging with apps, we rely on apps. Over time, our vision will become lower. You don't want to be like not able to, I don't know, use Google Maps or something like this when you, uh, you are older. So for Airbnb, that's 30%, and um, they also found that they have metrics that move up as they add accessibility to their features, so that's really cool. I think you should check this blog post. And many more blog posts, like if you do anything with typography, just 
pick one of those from my slides and go read it and explore all of the challenges that you will face before you dive into this. Because it is challenging. And that's why there are so many resources. But yeah, we are not here to talk about this today, how challenging it is and how we should not do it. I think we should be inspired and do it, but just look at the trade-offs and like be informed what you're dealing with when you start. So don't be ashamed if your app doesn't support dynamic type. A lot of big apps took ages to support it. Today we're gonna modernize hard-coded fonts, preferred fonts for textiles and custom fonts and see how we can use these accessibility settings. So hard-coded fonts, similar to hard-coded colors, you pick them in one place, your designer says, I want 21 pixels, uh, 21 points, okay, cool. Um, you select the style, the size, um, you get a lot of good things for free for this, for free. Um, you receive updates with OS versions if Apple changes their font from San Francisco to something else and withdraws it and it's perfect, you'll get that. And you support the bold um, accessibility setting by default, but they don't scale. And we can make them scale, it's just that you need to move from selecting the font in the interface builder, you need to move to code. And this is how you can do it using the UI font metrics API. So you create font metrics for a certain font, and then you say, I want this font to scale as the body text style. So you give Apple a little bit of information how this text is used in your case, and they will project their like font sizes and letter spacings and stuff that they believe are appropriate for different settings um, that the users will have. Um, so this is also another type, it's called preferred fonts for a certain textile. These support scaling, but as you can see, you select them and you don't have size or weight. So if your designers are pretty particular about, I want this specific size and this weight, I want italic font, you can't have this from here. So you might also need to scale those. But just for a reference, this is from Apple's documentation. These are all of the styles that are currently available with their respective uh, size points and tracking, which is like um, the space between letters. And if you're using preferred fonts, you can select them in Interface Builder. You don't control the weight and size. We already said that. Um, and once you set them, like they scale for the current setting, but they don't scale automatically if someone goes and says, I want slightly bigger text. To do that, you need to also tick automatically adjust font for a UI label or set it in your code. So with custom fonts, it's very similar to system fonts. Um, so you can scale them exactly the same way. This is the same example, just the name is a custom font name here. Um, but they don't support bold setting by default. So if you also want to support the bold setting, you need to keep track of the trait collection changes and then set a bold version of your font. And here in this example, I'm applying traits bold to a scaled font and I expect that this font should be scaled and bold. But it doesn't work. <laughs> because the order matters, and this is super frustrating the first time you discover it. So the right way of doing this would be to have a font to first make it bold, then to scale it, and you have a scaling bold font. So moving to the caveats, you already know that any changes you make to a font will remove the scaling. <laughs> and yeah, if you resize the font somewhere, if you make it bold, it will remove the scaling. It, which makes sense because a font that is 20 points probably should scale different than a font that is 30 points, but still it's pretty frustrating, especially because of the fact that font equality is not really what you expect it to be. So if you get just a UI font object and you want to know, is this font scaled? You cannot know because if you compare it to not scaled font, returns true. And this brings some 
nasty bugs. Um, I had experience with, for example, attributed strings. Um, there is some bug in UI kit where if you create two attributed strings and you use scaled font and non-scaled font for both of them, they will behave the same way. It's just pretty crazy. I opened a radar for it and they said there might be a solution coming soon. Uh, also, if you have some optimizations in your styling code saying like if this font is the same as the previous one, I don't want to update the attributes, this will also fail because the equality thing. And to be even better, if you scale a font that is already scaled, if you are like, okay, I just want to make sure that this font is scaled, it will crash. And the message is not super useful. So my recommendation for you is that if you don't use just the um, Apple textiles and you want to scale your fonts, you really do it in one place in like lazy static constants and then use it only from there. Just don't spread it around the code base because you experience these crashes. Last one, I promise. <laughs> Text with accessibility setting extra large can be extra large. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean that large. Um, yeah. Settings. You can scroll down infinitely. There are a lot of settings. It kind of works. I don't know if for your app this will work. And this is a pretty important thing. Like, I think this can be a very big, um, um, what do you call it? When you are stopped from making something, I don't know. You might decide, I don't want to support uh, dynamic type because I need to talk to my designers and make sure that all screens will have new designs for this huge text. And people say, no one has time for this now. So my recommendation for you is really simple. Just use cap dynamic type support initially. That's better than no dynamic type support. So you can use this method when you scale a font, you say maximum point size. I recommend to you that you choose a rather big size and you leave out only like the extremely big cases that you cannot handle. But this is an option for you if you just want to become slightly better but not like um, fully support those features. And dynamic type, adaptive interfaces is really so much more than just those hundred steps that I showed. It's about symbols, scaling your icons and scaling your images, making sure that everything fits nicely together, metrics, layouts, ultimately having your designers think about adaptivity. I'm going to take a look only at the metrics right now um, because I think there are a lot of similarities with fonts and typography. So I'll give you some tips. They're pretty much the same. So again, you need to move from hard-coded values. Um, there are a lot of APIs that Apple provide us to um, have like more scalable and dynamic values. So you can use the layout margins that have default values that scale between compact and regular sizes. You can use the readable content guide so that your content is on the iPad usually is in the middle of the screen with small text and then as you increase the text, these margins, they um, become smaller. And again, at linters, clean up a little bit cover most of your app, but don't aim for perfect because you will never reach that and you just keep postponing it. Um, for metrics, if you want to set them, um, if you want to customize, for example, the layout margins, you set a constant and then that constant will not update automatically. So I just wanted to point out here that there is still no corresponding API like the ones that were introduced for colors and fonts where you create an instance and it will automatically update for you. For metrics, you just use floats for now. So maybe in the future we have some wrapper that can do this functionality for us. And yeah, React to trade collection, the change if you want to provide different metrics for different trade collection sizes. Whew. To wrap up, well, I think I said this many times, but respect trade collection. Put everything that you have related to styling in trade collection, the change you will not regret. Of course, don't make like super big 
updates every time there um, to optimize a little bit performance, but don't optimize prematurely. Okay, next slide. <laughs> yeah, so make space for new things um, by cleaning up what you currently have and put that in order first. And I promise it will make you feel good and um, we can take inspiration from life, even from Netflix, and apply it to the way we approach this process. Ultimately, for me, going through these types of projects was time consuming, but at the end of the day, it does bring joy. It brings joy to me because I know where my styling is. It brings joy to users because they can uh, benefit from the features that Apple provides, and also to other developers. Um, yeah, don't just jump through these projects like lightheartedly. Just think about how much time it will be and how many stakeholders you have. Any of these modernizations are actual projects. And you need to be the person in the team saying, we can adopt this, this exists, and I know what are the technical trade-offs. So I want you to go back to your work and have conversations with your teams with providing the technical expertise, but also listening to what the product needs, and what designers needs, and what the users needs. So that was my talk. I'm Natalia, working in iZetto. Um, if you have any questions for me, I work in the design platform team at iZetto, so we're bringing this like few steps further in our daily job. Uh, I will be happy to chat with you about these things. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much. Um, I don't know if anybody saw this, but I just want to go back one slide, the dress and the slides. <laughs> no one noticed, right? Well, actually, Manu noticed it and tweeted about it. I was like, wow, this is like, uh, yeah. It's happening. Yeah. Also, uh, I, I never thought we would actually have a talk where we speak about Marie Kondo. Um, <laughs> But um, before I give you the opportunity to give the questions, um, I was thinking when you were speaking about the, uh, the bugs in UI kit that uh, there is actually a guy who actually gave a talk in 2015, a guy from Cologne, uh, uh, Michael Ox, which is now working on the UI kit team. So I think I will... Uh, Try to find where he will... Help him, okay. um, so to say. All right, questions? Let me go there. All right. Hi. Uh, how would you share um, your design or uh, theme uh, between apps? With a Cocoa pot, for example, or do you share it? Um, you can have, um, okay, this is pretty much depends on what your setup is. Um, I was thinking, and the approach that I'm taking is like having a package that is for multiple platforms actually, that produces things that can be read by iOS. So then you can integrate it the way you want with um, package manager or with um, cartridge or whatever. Um, I'm not going to speak about the dependency package managers, but like if you have the need in your organization to and, and commitment to share these col um, this colors and typography around in different apps, you can make a separate package that just publishes new versions of them. And I think this is what a lot of companies are doing that have design systems. So you can you, uh, look at um, Lottie from Airbnb. They have actually a common, uh, sorry, not Lottie. Lottie is for animations. Oh my god. Um, what was the name of the? Lona, yeah. Pretty similar. Lona has like a common format for sharing tokens. Um, yeah. All right, thanks. Hmm? Who, where goes the mic? <laughs> In the meantime, while your guys are thinking, you mentioned um, Swift Jam. I've been thinking mm -hmm. myself about using it. Are you guys using it at iSettle? Um, I'm not sure whether I should make I, statements I like this. I, really I used Swift Gen 
in a lot of projects yeah. and uh, it works nicely for me especially for colors that's what i was thinking about yeah. colors yeah, yeah. for the colors they have a really nice plugin that is from assets catalog generating constants they've been a little bit slow with updating to swift 5 but the nice thing about swift gen is that you can just with one line uh, make a copy of existing template and it will be automatically picked up by Swift Gen so you can make any changes there so the way I use it is like they didn't update the um, uh, like the modificators private public to match the Swift 5 to not give warning so I changed that and have also like some some other auto generated code in the template and the nice thing is just works with Swift Gen so you can customize it okay. hmm? right over there the mic Thank you. Um, question: How do you communicate with your designers? So, when when they are changing colors, do you have something like an example app where all the colors are in there that the designers can pick, or how do you make sure that you actually are synced? Yeah, again, depends on your setup. If you have centralized setup, you might have not one. Um, styling uh, app that shows the reference colors, but you might have another interface, like a web interface that shows the colors from the package because those same colors will be used on iOS, Android, web. Um, but if you have only iOS app, yeah, you can start with creating a reference app and show all the colors there. But the hardest thing about changing colors is actually spreading that out, like the information throughout the organization. So. Yeah, we have a design platform team. We are kind of the the medium to share this across all platforms. Um, in your particular organization, can be different. Thank you. All right, I'm looking at the time. If there is a last one, I will take it. Otherwise, yeah. all right. Hey, uh, quick talk. Um, what's your take on UI uh, appearance proxies? Did you ever use that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, UI appearance proxies, um, they work with the same things. Like if you set UI appearance, you need to provide a color, provide a font. So I use UI appearance for the most generic stuff, but then UI appearance doesn't have such good API to take care of case by case. And I was looking forward, like with iOS updates, whether Apple will decide to make any changes to UI appearance to accommodate for those things. And so far, I don't think that that's the direction. But yeah, definitely use UI appearance for um, your um, spreading those um, styling things to your elements. And trade collection did change. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, we will have Bas speak after the break. Um, and by the way, in the meantime, I have a really good news for all the speakers. Um, you guys will have to pick which one of those posters you get to bring home. Woo! My mic um, will fall. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so um, that's it for now. Um, and yeah, see you in about 15 minutes. And a round of applause, obviously. Oh, thank you.